Ever since I was a kid, and likely a lot of other people feel the same way, there was just something about the concept of riding a train in inclement weather through a dark forest knowing that whatever is out there really doesn't matter because you're comfortable inside the cabin all while watching it pass by at a high rate of speed that few animals could match. Essentially, you're completely safe from the outside world at that moment, whereas other animals might not be so fortunate. It's great to be human. Well, that is until a seven foot monstrosity throws a deer at the train, severing the fuel lines and stranding you there as it tries to work its way in and break through the safety of the cabin. As a red eye train makes its way across the Thornton Forest in England, man, we've been doing a lot of England videos lately. Shout out to my editor dealing with Georgia levels of heat out there. Stay golden, pony boy. The group of passengers would find themselves besieged by something that would stalk just beyond the doors of the train. At first, seeing as they were only a few miles away from the next town, they would begin to wonder why not just open up the doors and leave. But it would become quickly apparent that would be basically a bold strategy, Cotton. They'll see how that works out for them. And not work out for them, indeed it did. As the creatures lurking in the forest became more and more aware of their presence, they would begin to actively hunt the passengers. So in today's episode, we'll be discussing these, uh, things in the movie Hal, and not the Little Red Riding Hood version that has the exact same name, not exactly sure how that works, which actually come to think of it, there's like five or six movies with the exact same name. Anyways, what sort of mutations were inspired by the infection, because I do believe to be an actual infection, and really, why being infected is the ultimate form of gains. But first, this episode is sponsored by Audible. Are you ready to have access to thousands and thousands of audiobooks right at your fingertips? Well, I am because I'm literally about to drive from Georgia to Seattle for PAX West this year, and I have a real phobia of flying, so that's why I'm doing that. Aren't amygdala's great? Well, if that sounds like you, new members can enjoy Audible free for 30 days today by visiting audible.com forward slash Roanoke or texting Roanoke to 500-500. Driving in a car, it can get boring after four hours, no matter how awesome your playlist is. By listening to audiobooks, you can stay more engaged mentally while driving and pass the time listening to your favorite titles. Maybe you want to hang out by the pool because it's 3,000 degrees outside currently. Well, you can listen to your audiobooks there as well. Or maybe on the train or at the gym, wherever you want really. And with audiobooks covering almost every genre that you can think of, there's plenty to choose from. As an Audible member, you'll also get a credit every month good for any title in the entire premium selection, which are yours to keep forever. And considering for me personally, Wrath Classic is about to drop, I have been enjoying refreshing my memory on World of Warcraft lore because I'm a giant nerd. So again, by heading to audible.com for slash Roanoke or texting Roanoke to 500, 500 new members can enjoy Audible free for 30 days today. All right, let's get back to it. So we kick off our story at a train station. As a man walks through, he is wrapping up his shift for the night and is ready to throw deuces for the evening. As a guy asks him where to go, known affectionately just simply as man on platform, and the only reason I really bring this up is because for some reason, the titles of the passengers later were like assertive man and glamorous woman and subdued man and scared woman and man of steel. You know, all the usual names that really, they have names, but it was just bizarre. No reason to bring it up other than the fact that it made me laugh in the movie if you turn the subtitles on. As Joe goes to his locker, he gets the old we regret to inform you letter as another guy walks up gloating about how he's a supervisor now, and he now controls everyone, including Joe, and how his wife keeps disappearing at 7 p.m. every night and not coming home till 3. You know, real alpha male grind set mentality. But literally, so Joe is like wrapping up his shift, but apparently the labor laws are a little lax in the train industry because he informs him that he's actually taking the red eye to Eastboro as Ken called in sick. You see, Ken is a Sigma male. And in this dissertation, I plan on explaining the intricacies between the two. This upsets Joe, as it would with anyone, because I'm not trying to do a night shift on top of my day shift. But Joe is apparently really hard up for a job, I suppose. Joe then spots female interest number one, which changes his mind. The game plan is to get to Eastboro by 1.48 a.m., just in time to do absolutely nothing. Although it's England, so there might be something open by them. But as Joe walks around and checks tickets, he gets got by a chihuahua, which never shows up again, by the way. And stops at a woman named Kate. He asked her for her ticket and she lost it. And now she's upset about how she has to pay a penalty fare. Well, I guess you should have just kept a hold of your ticket then, huh? The importance of being an adult and keeping track of your own stuff, huh? As Joe continues checking tickets, there is this painful interaction with uh, the teenager, I think, maybe lower 20s, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really honestly sure what she's supposed to represent, although later she's supposed to be a teenager, but as he checks her ticket, she's insufferable, but no worse than assertive man who is uh, looking at his ticket when asked about it. Like, bro, that's when you just start making up like arbitrary rules about how they must be holding their ticket. You can't just glance at it. But Joe then spots Ellen. As he goes to talk to her, they stop in front of the world's number one soccer fan eating a kebab. Joe asks Ellen if she wants to get a drink after, which uh, honestly goes over like a fart in church. Is it her shooting him down or not reading the situation? It doesn't really matter, but my boy does a big swing and a miss, as in the soccer fan pokes fun and then disappears in the bathroom for several hours. Well, after that awkward encounter, there's nothing to do but look out the window and contemplate your life choices on why you 
you choose the beginning of a trip to ask and not the end, because now you've got the rest of the time to sit there in the awkwardness. Sometime later though, the train violently stops. Joe goes to check out what's happening, spotting movement beyond the door, as well as a rummaging noise. The driver comes over to the intercom, telling everyone that something hit the fuel line and that there will be along shortly. Joe opens up the door and has difficulty lifting a 20 pound cart for some reason, so assertive man has to. He hands him his keys and then Joe walks off. The driver now has exited the mobile facility. He takes a look at the fuel line, trying to figure out what may have happened as Joe continues to check on the passengers. Heading to the farthest back cart, Nina is losing her mind because her phone fell out of her hands and landed on the ground, and the back has popped off. Don't worry, you'll absolutely learn to hate Nina. It's fun, trust me. Joe gives her the old calm down, calm down, everything will be alright, and then she calls him a pervert for trying to call her now. See, she's annoying. As the conductor we have a problem keeps walking like all the passengers are upset. I mean, the train stopping didn't really seem that violent to me, but like, everyone's on the ground and picking up their stuff. Can trains really stop that fast? I'm not so sure about that one. Joe calls the driver, but gets no answer, so he does the only thing he can and sits down while the driver continues looking before finally spotting the issue. It appears as though a seven foot tall, half werewolf, half mangy thing threw a freaking deer under the wheels of the train and hit the fuel line. So here's my question, how exactly? That thing would have been chewed up by the wheels like you would not imagine. But as the driver tries to free the meaty obstruction, he hears something in the woods around him. So it's time for a PSA. So there's a few people here who watch this channel, and if you ever find yourself having music on the speaker of your phone, and you're in an enclosed area with others, for the love of God, know that everyone around there wants to take that phone and cram it where the sun doesn't shine. Because look at Nina here. Not only is she listening on speaker, but she's also singing, which nobody wants to hear that either. God, I hope she gets eaten by like a seven foot tall hairless monstrosity on top of a train or something. But seriously though, don't do this. It's the biggest cringe imaginable. So the driver has given up on his endeavors because turning around, a werewolf is giving him a big old hug. You know, for warmth, because it's cold out there in the rain. But most everyone felt the hug hit the train, and oh, here's Nina again, smoking in an enclosed train. Yes, very good. Joe at this point goes to check on the driver, not seeing him. Of course, he does the actual smart thing and doesn't just run out there going, oh, Tony, where are you at? He then tells Ellen that they need to keep the passengers calm with two sandwiches. Joe continues to walk down using the train as the way to move down rather than the outside of the train. Again, very smart, but we see something is watching him from the wood line. Calling back to the station and letting them know their predicament, the storm has knocked down trees, derailed trains, and put them pretty low in the queue. Because of this, it's going to take no less than four hours for them to get out there, which this in turn upsets the passengers. Joe says the driver is working on it by lubricating the tracks with his blood, which upsets the passengers more as the driver is gone. A certain man yells and says that they just need to walk it out as it's really not that far, which okay, honestly, I would probably suggest the same thing. I don't want to sit on a train for hours when I could easily just walk back to the station in three miles. But that's what's crazy is they're not even that far from civilization. As they all exit, they realize the rain has stopped too, but is looking extra October spooky out there. Joe takes point as they begin entering the forest, but as they walk, they realize something is just beyond the bushes following them, but they can't get a good look at it. Joe and Ellen walk out there to find that the driver is laying on the ground giving his guts some fresh air, you know, for health reasons. Very therapeutic. But as they find this, howls start erupting all around them as everyone runs back to the train. The assertive man asserts his way to the front as Joe waits for the elderly. See, that's what we call a dichotomy. They help the man inside and then grab Janae, but she leaves her leg outside for some reason, having learned nothing from being a child and knowing of the boogeyman. Well, that was a pretty bad idea as the creature grabs her calf and bites. It lifts her up in the air trying to tear off her leg, but Granny ain't no chump. They're able to pull her in, but I gotta tell you, judging by that oozing wound, that's definitely the small saphenous vein, and it's been punctured. Maybe not lethal, but you have to kind of get that bleeding under control pretty quickly, because I also doubt she has that much blood to lose. So as she wails, Ellen does the right thing and drops a ton of water on it, which if you didn't know, actually does help. There's arguments that it can screw with the ability of the wound to clot, but really it washes away contaminants, and if it's clean water, it can actually reduce the possibility of infection. But really nobody on there has been trained in first aid, so they aren't 100% sure what they're doing. That said, applied pressure is always a standard, more so on a low pressure wound like this. So they get it wrapped up the rest of the way, and the passengers then look outside as something begins banging on the side of the train. Everyone goes quiet as they listen to what this creature is, as it begins rubbing its nails across the side of the train before howling and moving on. Ellen tells Joe that they need to call someone, but he's a little bit in shock. He eventually pulls it together and then heads to the driver's nest. He calls out, but nobody answers as Billy comes up and talks to him. He says there's no fuel pressure, so that's probably the issue. They need to get it fixed before they can do anything. That said, as the camera zooms out, it appears the creature sabotaged the communication at the top of the train, indicating that it's actually pretty intelligent. As they discuss what it was, they try to figure out if it was maybe a bear or wolf, but apparently those have been cleared out for centuries, and enough room on the island for both man and other predators. The older woman mentions how it looked like a man, but also like an animal. They then hear a noise from inside the train. Billy and Joe run to check it out as a sort of man lags behind because he's lame. A sort of man 
and then asks if Billy has a knife, which is hilarious because if this was in the US, you'd likely have a lot more than that. And you'll see that would have been really useful in this situation. Like this movie would have been five minutes long. But basically, I don't think assertive man thinks very highly of Billy. So as they head to the bathroom, Joe opens up the door as it's the number one soccer fan extraordinaire falling out of the bathroom. He's upset about being told the news. That means really he missed his stop, but not the flesh eating beasts outside. As glamorous woman moans, it's, it's actually her name in the subtitles. I just remember that. They check her wound and it ain't looking too good. And she's going in shock as well as supporting a fashionable fever. Kate then goes to check back on Nina like she deserves it. Kate mentions how Nina is a teenager, so she is definitely a teenager. And that explains the all around bad attitude. Ah, hormones. There's really nothing like it back in the day. As everyone kind of just hangs out, the beast decides enough train rating, time for a durability test. As they go quiet, Nina gets a call on the phone and they start swamping her as she just says no please a lot for some reason, but Mr. Werewolf ain't having it and then rips her out of the window as she starts screeching on the roof. And that ain't looking too good. The car is now officially compromised. Matthew has stopped Kate from going up with Nina. So Kate is now like mad at Matthew. Like she could have really done anything against that thing on the roof. All I'm saying is Matthew's the goat. So now the old man takes charge. He gets everyone set by saying, quit whining. If you want to go home, act like you want to go home. So we now get like the Dawn of the Dead bus fortification montage. And Kate now apologizes to Joe for being a douche canoe earlier. I mean, it was her fault for losing her own ticket as the rest of the group elects to just sort of like wait out in the fortified car at this point. Jenny also isn't looking so hot as they are running low on water and her fever is progressing quickly. Jenny asks what the girl's name was that was pulled onto the roof and literally nobody knows. What a way to go. Now, assertive man starts to flex on Joe for absolutely no reason. He talks about how he has a flat in the city for college girls and a country house for his wife and kids. God, this guy is such a tool. He then goes on to state how everyone there are natural born victims, old, weak, afraid. Basically the mentality that isn't much better than what an animal would sport. Because remember, humans became great when we picked up rocks and threw them at predators to save the weak and old. At this point, Joe goes into the next car to get Paul as it's been too long. Paul tries to get out, but the door is broken again. And that's literally how he got locked in there previously. Now, the rooftop werewolf has noticed this as well and begins attacking him by entering through the roof. It basically wrecks him on the other side of the door as Joe tries to get back into the fortified car. A certain man attempts to bolt out of there as the werewolf begins making its way towards Joe. They pull him through and then jam a wrench through the door that opens long ways. I know. What? I'm not even sure how that works. Just like open the door. It doesn't swing in and out. It literally opens sideways. What is a wrench gonna do? And like the wrench, it e it, it is barely even touching the handles on the door. Like it, they could easily just pull it apart. Anyways, as the werewolf continues to shake the door, eventually the wrench falls and it's finally able to come through. I know it's dumb. <laughs> oh, there he is. There's my handsome boy. It approaches Joe and good lord, this thing is weird looking. But the group decides to third party the creature, which honestly, I was not expecting it to work. I mean, look at this thing. It looks completely roided up, but it does work. It grabs Billy as a certain man then hits it, and Matthew comes in with an axe to finish the job. So he's going ham on it, but Kate's like, no, stop, it's gone. No, dude, let him keep hitting it. Like, <laughs> disassemble that thing as much as possible. I mean, go on with your bad self, man. As Joe takes a look at it after, he surmises that it was a man, but its teeth, legs, size, it's all different. So then we get the movie trope, right? Despite everyone here just being a regular common person and literally seeing the creature right in front of them, nobody wants to actually call it what it is. It's like in World War Z when they say, yeah, it's a zombie. And then like all the scientists and top personnel roll their eyes like, okay, well, what would you guys call it? And in this movie, they call it a werewolf and everybody scoffs like, look at that thing. I'd be calling that a werewolf too. And anyone who scoffed, oh, did I not identify his genus and species correctly? Like, oh my God, what would you call it, Brainiac? Don't let my colloquialism simplify it. We wouldn't want that. Like, I don't even know why I'm turning up at this point so much. Like, anyways, moving on. This trope is just so dumb as normal people would be like, yep, agreed. That's a werewolf. That's what that thing is. So they find a ring on the werewolf, solidifying that indeed it was a man at one point. They think it's some sort of mutation as assertive man suggests it could be spread by biting, which means Jenna is about to turn. Her husband launches into an explanation of these things. Back in 1963, there was a wreck. And when emergency services finally got to the train, everyone was half eaten or missing altogether. A lot of talks swarmed around it, but nothing was ever concrete. As they continue discussing, my handsome boy then gets back up and begins howling. And that is why you should have let Matthew run with the mental break that he just had and completely destroy this thing because it's calling for help. Joe at this point has now become the alpha human he was always meant to be and introduces the creature's limbic system to the light of day to shut it up. But it's too late as the others begin howling in response. We now see that there's an entire pack out there. As Jenny begins responding to something, a certain man tries to tell him that she's infected. Ged tells him to go away, but a certain man is being too assertive. Some would say even aggressive at this point. Joe tells the group to tie up aggressive man after punching him as well as Jenny. Plan is now devised. Matthew and Billy will head outside to locate the fuel issue. Joe tells 
everyone in the back that they have this plan and basically that they're getting out of there. Heading outside, it's looking even more spooky. Billy looks along the train to attempt to find the fuel leak. He spots it like massively quick, way quicker than the driver did. So Kate and Subdued Man now share a moment where she's like, oh, don't you remember me? Spoiler, he doesn't. He mentioned something about kids and baby weight and losing the spark. Basically, he's just being a giant tool. There's nothing wrong with hooking up, but bro, you got a wife and kids. That part of your life is over. Subdued Man then tells Kate that they need to get rid of Jenny after that inspiring speech, which she then declines. I know, right? I can't believe his honeyed words didn't work after he just insulted her. Joe and Ellen now have a moment about the promotion Joe didn't get. He wanted to matter, but considering that strikeout earlier, I mean, he, he kind of talks about how nobody noticed him and Ellen didn't even notice that he was trying to ask her out. But anyways, back outside, Matthew does a terrible job of keeping the light on Billy so that he can work, but he uses the power of flex tape to patch up the fuel line so everything's good to go. Somewhere, Phil Swift is definitely smiling upon this merger of fuel, rubber, and flex tape. But while Billy is doing this, Matthew hears someone say, help me in the woods, and bro, like, no. But he's not me, so he goes out there like a pork tenderloin that he is trying to find Nina. He apologizes and then spots her in the tree being eaten by another werewolf. So you've earned this one, bro, which by the way, how is she actually still alive? There's like a ton of blood on the window earlier, and her lungs are like literally exposed in that tree. I don't know, man. But the pack now gives chase as Matthew swings away, but it's not enough, and he is overtaken by the werewolves. So he lets out a scream that alerts everybody back on the train, and then they let out a howl as Jenny begins changing and responding to the howls. Billy gets the train working once more with the fuel pressure as they decide it's the perfect time to GTFO. The werewolves now approach where Billy is, but considering he's got fuel all over him, when they look down, they don't really spot him as they can't really locate him because he pulled himself up under the train and they can't smell him. Joe and Ellen wait as long as they can, but they decide nope as the creature appears at the front window. Jenny has officially changed now and begins attacking everyone back in the train. Subdued Man has now morphed into Treacherous Man as the door opens and Kate gets grabbed, which he then Spartan kicks her off the train, but not before taking the wrench. As the train pulls away, look, all I'm saying is this, adrenaline is going to be absolutely coursing through your veins. Who knows? You might be able to outrun these things. Don't just crawl there. Start sprinting. At least give it the old college try. But Kate doesn't because the power of kids and survival does nothing apparently. And she tries to reason with the werewolf. But that goes over about as well as reasoning with a werewolf. Interestingly, at this point, Treacherous Man becomes Defensive Man. And he tries to take out Jenny before it gets to the old man. But he then gets punched. So Jenny gets back up and now starts consuming her husband. My wife and I were watching this last night and I had to inform her I would have to take her out as uh, I enjoy the arrangement of my carotid and jugular that I have within my neck already. Jenny now turns on Scared Man. Also, Billy is just hanging out under the train and accidentally reopens the fuel line, stopping the train once more. The werewolves have also caught back up to the train and Joe accidentally saves Cowering Man from Jenny. Joe then punches Cowering Man, who continues to cower like a coward, but they decide that they need to get out of there. Officially, the werewolves are on the train. As Joe goes to open the door, he's hit by Backstabbing Man before Ellen puts a shiv on him, which the hell yeah, Ellen. Of course, Joe left his keys in the door, which allows for backstabbing man to become escape man. Okay, enough of that joke. Billy now arrives to save Joe and Ellen by burning the werewolves. Joe and Ellen get the door open as they heroically leave Billy behind as he screams while being eaten. And I guess I bet on the wrong horse with that one. The werewolves now give chase to Ellen and Joe, but they realize they're not really gonna make it. Joe decides to stay behind and kisses Ellen, letting her go ahead as he goes to fight the werewolves as they have become aware wolves, get it, aware wolves, anyways, of his location. Ellen does a half run down the road as Joe begins his final confrontation with the pack. Unfortunately for him, Mama Werewolf is really good at hugs and bites him in the neck as the rest descend on him as well. Later on at the train station, Ellen has arrived for her shift as I'm sure the supervisor will tell her she has another red eye towards Eastboro. But we also have to check in with our boy Hiking Man. Joke's not over apparently, so it's weird. As he goes through, he spots Joe's jacket and is like all happy, calling a mate like, oh, you're here, I, oh, oh God. Uh, except, you know, he then realizes that it's actually just a straight ambush and when he goes around a tree, he spots Joe, and on all levels except physical, he's a wolf. Joe then leads the attack, tearing him apart like a meat man, wrapping up our story nicely, with Team Werewolf taking one L, and Team Human taking like 12 Ls. Oh well, there's more of us probably. So first things first, as the kids say, no cap, I enjoy this movie, and that was painful to say. Actually, I'm never gonna say that again. If you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth a watch, despite what I basically just told you. The pictures of the werewolves being somewhat humanly mutated monsters was awesome. Not too many changes to the skull itself, no ridiculous growth overall. I mean, there, there is a lot of growth. Not changing back to normal in the daylight. I mean, it's pretty cool. So I figure the first place we should start is what exactly this is, and then discuss the physical ramifications of these things turning into these creatures. To start, getting a look at these things, the first thing I'm inclined to believe is that this is a physical disease, potentially an ancient one, that would appear to spawn out of the force of Thornton from centuries previous that results in these creatures. Like a continuous line that has dwindled down to just a handful left, seeing as there are not too many of these creatures around. Not to mention, whenever they lose,
lose one, they seem to sort of like replenish that lost member instead of attempting to convert as many as possible. Getting a good look at the group, we see that we have three females initially with one male. Now obviously, they aren't running around having just werewolf babies or anything, but this small pack seems to be basically the limit it wants to reach. Seeing as when the male is taken out on the train, the pack replaced the missing male with Joe rather than just eating him like they did with all the others. Now this could be for a multitude of reasons, but it appears to be unrelated to fighting ability as they had already taken out Matthew, even though he was willing to fight. So it appears that they more likely rely on potential perceived social standing, which sounds complicated. But remember, these things are actually pretty smart considering it did know what a radio antenna is. So basically the mentality of Joe at the end would indicate strong pack member. It is also possible that they didn't choose Matthew in the woods as they didn't actually know the other male had been taken out on the train. But upon entering the train and finding his remains, they needed to replace him. So this has nothing to do with the disease. I just kind of got on a social cue examination side tangent. But basically, I think it came down to Joe displaying certain traits, such as willingness to fight his behavior and their need to replace a lost male. So back to the disease portion. This would be a very old disease that again has likely plagued the area since long before man became the dominant factor within this area. As mentioned by the old man, in 1963, a similar fate befell the people who were on the train heading towards Eastboro, which means the deer ending up on the tracks or being thrown into the tracks was a hunting technique employed by the male in order to get the train to stop, which we will cover how they might be able to maintain their intelligence in a moment. This disease appears to spread specifically through the saliva as other bodily fluids do not have an impact. For instance, Matthew was absolutely covered in blood, which would definitely have come into contact with his mucous membranes and yet didn't have any issues. Once Jenny was bitten, the disease spreads from the salivary glands of the werewolf and considering it does not appear as present in the blood based on the aforementioned scenario, this would mean it likely is a nervous system disease, which may bring it into the realm of something which I hope is everyone's favorite disease at this point, rabies. If you haven't seen the sadness video, I go pretty deeply into how rabies actually travels through the body, but here's the quick and dirty for you. Rabies will enter through broken skin, but should the skin be intact, you are more than likely going to be okay. Once in, it will then enter the peripheral nervous system and attach to proteins utilized by the nerve cells known as motor neuron proteins. This process is active and pushes it closer and closer to the central nervous system at an accelerated rate. Once here, it's a quick process, then heading to the brain, replicating until eventually causing acute encephalitis, resulting in the end of the human, but not before moving down into the salivary glands, inducing aggression via the alteration of the limbic system, which is specifically the amygdala, in an attempt to continue spreading. This ancient dreaded disease by humans would absolutely have some parallels with the werewolf disease that we see displayed in HAL. Upon entering the broken skin, like with Jenny, it would appear that due to the proximity it had to the brain, you'd expect the process to happen more slowly, and possibly it did, considering it took hours for her to change, whereas with Joe, it appears like with his neck being bitten, it took less than an hour, as he had already turned by early morning when assertive man found him once more. Now, this is not to say that it's just the brain at play, but this appears to be a whole body infection potentially spreading by the actions of the nervous system proteins, which means some of it may actually travel by blood. But upon moving into the rest of the body, it would appear that the virus would utilize the standard method of entering cells based on highly specific cellular receptors that is likely present throughout the entire body, which I base this on several reasons. The main one being that this is a full body infection and appears to affect all the cells of the host, whether it be musculature, integument, skeletal, or nervous. We will get into why this is the case in the moment, but upon entering the cells, I would be inclined to believe that this is a DNA virus. Essentially, that means that the genome of the virus is made of deoxyribose nucleic acid, or just DNA. So instead of it being ribose nucleic acid, which is RNA, and they can either be double-stranded or single-stranded. They possess their own ability to encode into your DNA, utilizing their own polymerase, and as a result, what happens is it becomes a permanent part of your genome until it is either broken by replication or cut off if it encodes in the junk DNA portion, or just something happens to it, right? So in fact, 8% of the human genome is nothing more than ancient viruses, showing that this process is incredibly common. But the benefit of encoding into the DNA is that at random, the body will encode it into mRNA, which is then sent out and built by the cell, potentially leading to spikes in illness and its ability to spread to other organisms, thus infecting them. Now, the issue is, however, accidents happen. By not correctly replicating everything during mitosis or damage that could occur specifically to that gene in that cell from things like UV radiation, this can lead to variations of the virus. These variations may cause the virus to become more aggressive or induce different changes down the line. So what am I suggesting, I hear you asking? Well, I believe that the virus is likely just a normal virus, but very old. It's possible that back in the past, I mean, the virus could have come from wolves, but it's not like completely necessarily just wolves, but really any digit-to-grade animal may have been the target, but considering that 
there were wolves and may have come from them. Now there is a, a caveat to all of this. What I'm about to go into, I am not suggesting that like <laughs> uh, swine flu is going to make you exhibit pig-like qualities, but we are going to talk about how genomes can become a little more messy. But anyways, to continue, the thing to know about viruses is it's not a perfect process. Viruses sometimes carry out their own form of genetic engineering by basically spiking the punch bowl with some of the genetic information from the previous host as it gets incorporated into their viral coding, which is then carried and implanted into the new host's DNA. The thing to know about life is it's exceedingly messy. There are several crossover events and nothing is 100% effective. This is potentially what has happened concerning the physical mutations of the human form when it comes to this disease. Ancient wolf DNA at some point was incorporated into the virus that may have infected a human through a bite that was then encoded into that person's DNA. Probably a little clunky at first, this process would become more and more familiar with the human genome, spreading quickly through those who were infected with each subsequent generation until finally leading to the incubation time that we see with Jenny and Joe. So with the virus discussed, let's talk about the actual effects of this interaction with the host body. So you know where we have to start, which we have to use our imagination somewhat as it's like not specifically shown, but considering the structure of the leg has changed into a digitigrade orientation, starting with the feet, we could expect to find the metatarsal bones have been lengthened to a pretty extreme degree. I suppose we are sort of shown it when the bigger werewolf is eating his Tony sandwich, but they would have to increase in size to almost double what they were now, at least on a normal human, indicating that the skeletal system is undergoing a massive amount of growth brought on by the virus, altering the behavior of the osteoclast and osteoblast, reshaping the bone, and potentially the reactivation of the epiphyseal plates, allowing for the increase in height all over the body, judging by the fact that the male werewolf is almost hitting his head when walking around the train. The other impact this virus may have on the body is getting a good look overall. The musculature of the infected is well beyond the normal status of a human body. In no way is this amount of muscle not obtainable by someone who trains every day and gets a fair amount of protein, but what this says to me is that considering the bone growth we see kicking into hyperdrive along with the skeletal muscle increasing to that of a literal bodybuilder, the metabolism of cells has greatly increased, indicating that likely the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, would be kicking it up higher as well as to support the cell's need for ATP as the body continues to operate at this increased level. We see some evidence to support this idea if we take a look at the integument system. The skin of the person is thick, like weirdly thick, appearing to have calluses with some portions and lines on it appearing thicker than other areas. And this would indicate that the mitosis has increased within this area as to provide protection, but this may also just be a side consequence of the body operating at this increased capacity. And because of this, this also has other cascading effects on the body and how this newly infected would operate. The same system also accounts for nails that we see, which have become razor sharp and used for disemboweling prey. And those are several inches in length with an increased amount of activity also in the hair follicles all over the body, leading to uh, the lower arm, back and leg hair, as well as an overgrowth on the top of the head. Strangely, however, we do not see that the beard has been affected in any ways, which is not what you would expect to find considering beards are incredibly common in humans. But we see that first and foremost, they operate sort of like animals though, driven by a bloodlust and the need to feed. This is clearly because if you were infected by this virus, the physical requirements would mean caloric intake would really have to match a higher level for your survival. Seemingly, they hunt this one area of the forest and have long since forgotten their human status. But this may be because the hunger they feel has blinded them and their ability to utilize their frontal lobe properly. Because looking at their faces, we see they have a similar human shape apart from the massive jaw that appears to almost like unhinge, and the teeth are several inches in length, likely brought on by the same effects that cause the bone growth all over the body. But the shape of the skull itself appears relatively unaltered, likely because as an adult, the plates tend to really just fuse together. Although the male werewolf, we do see some evidence that the skull attempted to grow by the large misshapen forehead area with the gash down it, possibly indicating that the skull there cracked. And this also changed the shape of the eye locations to some degree, making them wider apart. For them to operate in a way like they do when dealing with their former brethren, us, more instinctual areas of the brain, such as the limbic system and lower brain, would need to be in control or at least have a greater control. This suggests that over time, likely there was a reduction in the size of the cerebrum as it became less necessary and may have atrophied to a degree or been altered in some fashion by the DNA of previous wolf hosts when infected. Because again, the nervous system is clearly affected as for a creature to grow like this from their original human form and not just be completely paralyzed, the nervous system would need to be malleable to the effects of the virus, which clearly it shows it has that ability. But I will still die on this hill. I believe their frontal lobe is still working at a higher capacity than that of a wolves, but less than that of a humans, considering they still do remember what electronics are. They know how people call for help. They know what the issues are and they know how to kind of destroy human technology 
in an appropriate way, which would mean that it has a higher level of thought and understanding. But the last influence of the wolf that we can see, uh, wolf coating being in the viral package, is the eyes themselves. The iris will actually turn an amber pale yellow color, much like that of many wolves that we see in nature, although wolves' eyes can be green as well. But when we actually see these creatures in the dark, it's not just the irises that we are seeing, but the taptum lucidum. And that is located on the retina in the back of the eye, which helps nocturnal predators hunt in the dark by giving the eye a second chance to absorb light that it may have missed in the first pass. This gives them the ability to see in the dark extremely well, something we humans do not enjoy as much. But overall, this infection would cause a person's cells to essentially kick it into overdrive. All cells would have mitosis induced on them, likely by direction of the virus, containing potentially the growth information of what the wolf would have, as well as altering the person more and more as mitosis continues on, and information on how to grow is again supplied by the virus. And this leads us to a fusion of the two species almost, although clearly they're still having a more human-like characteristic than wolves. But I still do believe this is really more of a mundane and corporeal infection rather than something supernatural that we are used to when it comes to werewolves like in dog soldiers. My reasoning on this is that you can take these werewolves out with common methods. There's no need for a silver bullet. A fire extinguisher will do in the face of these creatures, literally. This means that even a spear would be a viable defense against them. Although, take into consideration with the increased mitotic abilities, healing factor is going to be higher than that of a normal person. This thing is a literal bodybuilder and it's towering over you. And also, another reason that I believe it's just be a regular infection is there's no hormone cycle needed by the light of a full moon for the virus's pathophysiology to present itself. Instead, once you turn, that's just it. It doesn't matter if it's day or night, your body will forever be altered and remain altered until you meet your end. And likely it will progress and become more altered the more time that passes. This may indicate that in 1963, the pack may have been much larger as the years have passed. It's remnants that are left and even really they themselves are aging considering the state that the other three pack members are in when they attack Joe. So to sum this whole thing up, furries are scary, but it's less furry ones in the Thornton Forest that are much more scary.